You've heard about data centers on Earth, those massive warehouses that store everything from YouTube videos to government secrets. But what about data centers on the moon? Yeah, it's a thing. I'm Kristen Fisher, an independent space journalist, CNN contributor, former Fox News White House correspondent, and the daughter of two NASA astronauts. And this is The Endless Void, where today we're exploring how the rocketing demand for data centers here on Earth due to the rise in AI is fueling this whole new industry of companies that are trying to create data centers in space. In fact, just last month, the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, confirmed to a fellow space journalist, Eric Berger of Ars Technica, that the reason he acquired a company called Relativity Space is because of this crisis. People are planning 10 gigawatt data centers. Now, just to do the translation, an average nuclear power plant in the United States is one gigawatt. Gives you a sense of how big this crisis is. One of the estimates that I think is most likely is that data centers will require an additional 29 gigawatts of power by 2027 and 67 more gigawatts by 2030. Gives you a sense of the scale that we're talking. These things are industrial at a scale I have never seen in my life. But so far, only one company has successfully tested a data center from the moon, and that is Lone Star Data Holdings. It's textbook-sized Freedom Data Center hitched a ride to the moon in March aboard Intuitive Machines' Athena Lunar Lander. But that's only the beginning. Check out the company's ultimate goal. And with the future goal of building and deploying exabyte and then yatabyte level facilities in lava tubes deep in the moon itself. Our goal is global backup, global refresh, global restore, all from the moon, all safe, secure, accessible, and sovereign. Data centers in lava tubes beneath the lunar surface? I had to learn more. So joining me now is the founder and CEO of Lone Star Data Holdings, Chris Stott. So Chris, I'd like to start by making two things really crystal clear for our audience. First is that data centers on the moon for Lone Star Data Holdings, it's not just part of the business. This is the business, right? Oh, absolutely. This is what we're doing. And even our next set of missions go up to in between the Earth and the moon and more. So no server farms in Iowa. You guys are going all in on the moon. That's how much you believe in it. All in in space, the whole way. And then the other thing that I want to make really clear to our viewers is the fact that, you know, this is not something that's happening 5, 10, 20 years from now. It sounds so sci-fi and futuristic, but this is, this is actually something that's happening right now, right? Oh, yeah. We just sent our third data center up into space and our second one to the moon. Third decade of the 21st century, right? Flying cars, data centers on the moon. What is the origin story for Lone Star Data Holdings? How did you come up with this idea? Oh no, this is this is gonna sound so awful. All right. I was like, I guess oh, no, I do yeah. like No, I just like I, I do sniff my own farts. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> so I was sitting at the TED conference in Vancouver in April of 2018. Mm -hmm. And a group of people came like a shadow fell across the breakfast table and I look up and I'm like, yeah. And they said, You're something to do with space, right? And I'm like, Yes. <laughs> and they said, We have a problem. Can you help us? And I was like, the market speaks. Adam Smith, Adam Smith. <laughs> The market. And I just went, yes, of course I can. And they looked so relieved. And they sat down and joined me for breakfast. And I said, oh, crap, what have I said yes to? And they were genuinely relieved. And they'd just gone through the not pettier. They had been affected by this incredible virus that escaped, this weapon of mass destruction. Hmm. And they said, look, we need to find a way to store our data off planet. Can you help us? And I was like, yes. OK, let's take a look. We can do this. Now, how we ended up working up and around the moon, that was a bit of a surprise to us even. But that's how it started customers saying, help. How did your wife, retired astronaut Nicole Stott, yeah. uh, oh, how did she react to this? Like, what, what was her first reaction when you were like, hey, darling, I'm going to build data centers on the moon? <laughs> I must admit, she turned around and looked me straight in the eye and she says, that is so cool. Wow. Now, she might have used an expletive in the middle there. But yes, she was like, that is so cool. You've got to do this. We're trying to back up the entire planet. Think of us doing storage, premium, secure storage. And the data sovereignty laws, that's a huge thing. A lot of people doing compute and we do storage, storage is heavily regulated and that is our sweet spot. 
but we do it by taking it off the planet, getting it away from all the trouble down here. Data now has a passport. So, for example, American data by law cannot be stored outside of America. It's all about jurisdiction and getting access to it for regulators and where does the transaction take place. And so how would the moon, I mean, it's not bypassing, it's not like a, a loophole no. in the law. Um, it is enshrined in, in space law, correct? Mm -hmm. So basically any data in space is the ownership of the, the country that, that launches yeah. it? Do I have Very that good. right? You have that right, yes. Space is the most regulated of all human activities. And that's a thing of beauty for what we're doing in storage and space, because it means that you're launching state, like you said, you bring that flag with you and your laws, your taxes, your rules and regulations come with when you go to space, like a ship on the high seas, but even more involved. And that's what allows us to do this. You talk about putting these data centers in orbit around the moon, on the surface of the moon and below the moon. I was really fascinated by that. Are, are you talking about putting data centers inside the lava tubes? Eventually, yes. As wow. soon as we can have access to like with Starship, those high capacity rides, absolutely. So our next missions go out to the lunar Lagrange point, this incredible zone of uh, equilibrium, gravitational equilibrium, sounds mm -hmm. crazy, right between the earth and the moon. We can do everything we need to do. Mm -hmm. And when we're ready, yeah, back into those tubes, which exist. When you look up at the moon tonight and you see those dark patches, the mare, mm -hmm. the seas, that is like the New York subway system like the London Metro. There are 2,700 lava tubes that we found. The one that we want to go to is up in the Marius Hills. It's 1,000 meters wide, 80 meters deep, and 93 kilometers long. And that's wow. one of 2,000. They're, they're everywhere. It's perfect build. And I mean, just looking at, once you see it, it's like, oh, wow, that would be a really secure place to store data. When you tell people what you do and what your company does, are they like, what? <laughs> like yeah. yeah, we get a lot of strange looks. They actually do a double take. They're like, what, what did you just say? And I'm like, oh yeah, we just set our third one up, you know? And they're like, what? And so, but oh, we're customer driven. Everything we're doing is, is demand pull, not technology push. We're using existing tech and just meeting the needs of a terrestrial market but happens to use space to do so. So do you actually have people, companies, entities, governments coming to you right now and saying, hey, we need this, we want this? Yes, and have wow. done since day one. Who can you say? I, well, I, what I can say is uh, G7 nations, NATO countries, and the states of our union. For example, we do a lot of work with the state of Florida. And so what's the appeal? Oh, it's safety. It really is the ultimate backup. It's because it's compliant with data sovereignty. So you can actually stay within your jurisdiction. You can be compliant. And yet by taking it up there, you're away from the wars, the disasters, the problems with communications, storms, flash floods, human error down here. Mm. And also I would imagine uh, hackers or thieves, yes. right? Like if you store your data on the moon, is it more protected from nefarious actors or nation states? It is. Exactly. They say data is the new oil. I would say it's more valuable mm. than that. Every time we look at our work, we, look, we think like a team from Ocean's Eleven trying to hack our data. And by going out that far, we actually have better communications. High latency means high security. And by high latency, you mean uh, a long delay yes. between the data on Earth and the data on the moon, right? Yeah, it is. You know, quite right, Chris. What we're doing is that latency is about 1.4 seconds each way. So if you were to hit a keyboard there and say, send my data to the moon and get something back, it'll be one, two, three. Now in space terms, that's a lot. Mm. So if, if you're down in low Earth orbit, like Starlink or what others are mm -hmm. planning and doing, you're talking microseconds, which is really important when you're, you're taking that compute load off the planet and doing mm -hmm. high intensity trading or whatever it is you're doing. But for storage, uh, three seconds round trip is like getting a movie from Netflix. And what about people's personal data? We're talking a lot about organizations, companies, the government, of the state of Florida, governments. Um, but what about my personal data, like photos and things that I have on my cell phone? I mean, could I give that to Lone Star Data Holdings? And would you guys back it up on the moon for me as a, as a, as a customer? Yes. Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be, have, I, I yeah. would feel better actually. <laughs> right? And the thing is the way we're doing it and we have a commercial brand that's coming out called Celine, it'll be really cool. And the mm -hmm. idea is that you know, if your phone gets lost, stolen, the power station goes out, there's a hurricane, whatever it is, 
you can look up at the moon and go, how cool is that? My, my family photos are all up there, nice and safe. As opposed to being in this very ambiguous cloud. <laughs> yes. We, get people, we actually get people saying, which cloud is it? And we're like, oh, no, those clouds are fantastic, massive facilities <laughs> full of servers. But yeah, we're backing up the cloud. We're backing up governments. We're backing mm. up corporations and hopefully people too. So Chris, this all sounds great in theory. And I know you guys have had some successful tests, but surely you guys are going to encounter some some major challenges along the way to make this happen, just in terms of launching this amount of hardware into the moon's orbit, cooling these data centers, right? I mean, that's a oh. huge issue with data centers here on Earth. So what are some of the, the biggest challenges that you guys see in the next you know few years to come as you try to make these data centers on the moon a reality? You mentioned the big one there, cooling. Mm. And for terrestrial data centers, power and cooling are two mm -hmm. of the biggest, biggest drivers of cost and the impact on the environment. And yet though, when we go to space, everything turns around, everything flips upside down on its head. And from our last mission, one of our biggest challenges is keeping the data center warm not cold. Oh, wow. Because we have this like natural cooling in space. And with the deep space, mm. it's like zero degrees Kelvin. It's incredible. It sucks all the heat out of everything. So how do you do it? How do you keep it warm? Is it solar, the sun? Yeah, we have solar panels for the power. Great, thank you. You've got a great big ball of fusion in the sky. It works really well. And solar power for the power, so free energy. And then we have to use existing satellite technologies where we carefully radiate the heat out we have a lot of shielding around things, and we can maintain a constant temperature on board the payload, the load that pays, which is where we keep all this uh, solid drives and keep all the electronics. But isn't that interesting? Yeah. It, it's fascinating. It, it sounds almost perfect, right? You've got uh -huh. the moon as this a physical location to back up the data from Earth. You've got unlimited power from the sun. You've got this natural coolant, the vacuum of space. What, what's the biggest challenge? Demand. So Just keeping up with demand? It's an exponential marketplace. It's stunning. So back in 2023, the human race was creating 2.5 quintillion bytes of new information every 24 hours. I had to look up quintillion. So that's like a thousand petabytes. It's like a million terabytes. It's what they call it, one exabyte a day. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. And our market's regulated data is about half of mm -hmm. that, 63%. Yesterday, I went back to the same market sources and I thought I was going to see we're doing five quintillion bytes a day, right? And I said, like, okay, we're not. We're doing 328 quintillion bytes a day. And wow. I was like, what the heck? Heck, sorry. You can and say that. This I can is, say that. I can say that's too. okay. Yeah, I can say, okay, <laughs> good. I can say, well, I was like, what the hell's going on? And of course, it's all the AI, the large language models. Yeah. And it's all the proliferation of the data they're creating, which is regulated and has to be kept. So we went from 2.5 quintillion a day, that's just a million MacBook Pros every 24 hours. Second goes one minute past midnight, doom, at least the next million boxes of MacBook Pros, like with a terabyte on each. And it's 328 quintillion bytes. I was, okay, so that is what kind of a multiple? And it, that's doubling. Mm -hmm. Not every two years, that's doubling every so many months. It's insane how much data we're creating. And what are the problems with data centers on Earth? Like, are we just running out of space? They consume too much water. How much of a backlog is there right now on Earth? Oh, we can't build them fast enough. Mm -hmm. uh, McKenzie had a report that came out last week that said they're looking at about $7 trillion of investment into data centers, terrestrial data centers. And that was the beginning. These are like modern day cathedrals. They run our entire modern day world. All of that technology that literally turns on the lights that we've come to rely upon. If we lose that, like at loss of a library of Alexandria, we're back to the 1800s and not in a nice way. We're so reliant upon this and we can't build them fast enough. We're consuming so much. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, maybe we should maybe lift some of this out of the atmosphere and maybe we should be backing it up somewhere where things go wrong down here. We at least have the backups up there. And that's what our customers are asking us to do is to mm -hmm. back them up. It de-risks them financially, legally, they're regulatory compliant and actually backing up the entire human race just in case. Because what could possibly go wrong? Right. <laughs> I, I mean, hey, I don't know. Just ask yeah. ask the dinosaurs, right? Well, thank you. Larry Niven, great author. The dinosaurs became extinct because they didn't have a space program. Hmm. Right. And then yep. the lot of the Library of Alexandria burnt to the ground by Julius Caesar's troops in the Roman Civil War. Right. And now throw in modern Ukraine and Russia and the not Petia virus that wiped hmm. out eighty percent of all data in Ukraine back in twenty seventeen and then got loose as a cyber weapon globally and did 
horrific damage. A whole book's written about how bad that was and how close we came as a species to losing everything. Wow. I know, right? Don't, don't, you can sleep at night. Sleep well knowing that we're here. <laughs> well, with this high demand comes competitors. Lone Star Data Holdings, not alone. You guys have some other competitors in the marketplace, including the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, who just purchased Relativity Space. What did you think when you learned that that's why, or at least part of the reason, that he was interested in acquiring Relativity? Oh, I love it. Uh, that was so awesome. We were so happy when that announcement really? was made. Yeah, because I mean, I've known Tim Ellis for many years. Great company at Relativity and for Eric, Eric Schmidt to come in and do this. Because here's the beautiful thing. Hmm. Low Earth orbit, right? You want to get nice and close to the ground for very low latency compute. Amazing. That's what they want to do. They want to put all the compute into low Earth orbit. Yes. Worse storage. We can back them up. Mm. In fact, we're already having all sorts of, oh, that's a nice little thumb thing came up. <laughs> um, see, good idea. But we can actually back them up. Oh, so you see a synergy. Oh, very much synergy here. Yes, we love what they're doing. We completely see the reason they're doing this. And for us, it's like a match made in heaven. Final question. Yeah. For anybody watching this that is like, I, I don't care. Why, why should I care about something like this data on the moon? It seems so nebulous and far-fetched. Like, personalize it for me. This literally touches every person on the planet. Yeah. For the first time in human history, we can be safe. That's the key here. We can actually well, keep what we've built. Well, our data can be safe. Our data can Maybe be safe. True. Our, our data, data can, can be, be safe. safe. Our humans yeah. may die, but at least the memory of us will live on. Yes. <laughs> um, Chris, thank you so much. Such a pleasure to, to pick your brain and talk to you and hear about all the exciting things that you're up to. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>